Good morning. One of the greatest novels in the English language is Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. The novel centers in the family of Mr. Bennet, who has five children, all daughters, none of whom can inherit his estate. Thus, Mr. and Mrs. Bennet need at least one of their daughters to marry well, to support the rest of the family and protect them all from falling into poverty. This goal seems to be in view when two eligible wealthy bachelors, Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy, come to town. Mr. Bingley appears friendly and cheerful, Darcy more haughty and awkward. But, spoiler alert, by the end of the novel, Darcy is revealed to be kind and honorable as well. Unfortunately, there are also some other bachelors, such as Mr. Collins. Mr. Collins is described as not a sensible man, and the rest of the book proves ample proof that this is the case. He is insufferable, sanctimonious, and sycophantic. Within a few days of meeting Elizabeth, the second oldest Bennett daughter, he proposes to her. Elizabeth rejects his proposal, and mere days later, Mr. Collins proposes to Elizabeth's friend, Char Charlotte, who accepts. Elizabeth is shocked and says so. Charlotte explains that she only wants a comfortable home and is convinced that Mr. Collins can offer this. Elizabeth wishes Charlotte well, but privately fears she will never be truly happy. I was reminded of Mr. Collins when reading our passage today, which tells about a contentious conversation between Jesus and the Sadducees. First, some background. In the Bible, the Sadducees are usually mentioned alongside the Pharisees. These are both groups that are having debates with Jesus. But while they were united in their opposition to Jesus, the two groups did not really get along. The Sadducees had considerable wealth, power, and status. They were heavily involved with the temple in Jerusalem, and they denied the resurrection. In contrast, the Pharisees were more populist, they were less reliant on the temple, and they affirmed the resurrection. Nowadays, of course, we think of belief in the resurrection as primarily being about what happens when you die. This is absolutely in view in the first century, but it's also a political stance. The Pharisees thought that in the age to come, not only individuals, but the whole people of God would be redeemed, revived, and restored. This belief gave them hope, hope to resist the Roman occupation and work for change in this world. In contrast, by denying the resurrection, the Sadducees were signaling their support for the current state of affairs, which just happened to have them in power. The narrator reminds us of this belief in verse 23, before the Sadducees go to ask Jesus their question. Put another way, the narrator is telling us from the start that this question may be disingenuous. The Sadducees' question is a bit strange. They begin by summarizing a law of Moses, which you can find in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25. The law is that if brothers reside together and one dies with a wife but no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Rather, she will be married to her husband's brother, and her firstborn shall take the name of the deceased to continue his line. Already you may be wondering, what if the widow doesn't want to marry her husband's brother? What if this is a Mr. Collins situation? Unfortunately, given the ancient context, there's no surprise the text doesn't really care about the wishes of the widow. But if the brother refuses to marry the widow, the widow is supposed to tell the town elders, who will summon him for questioning. And if he continues to refuse, she is told to pull off his sandals, spit in his face, and shame him for refusing to build up his brother's house. In other words, nobody has much of a choice here. Even the brother can, yes, refuse to marry the widow, but he will be publicly shamed. This system of marriage is called leveret marriage, from the Latin word for husband's brother. Leveret marriage may seem bizarre to us, with our modern notions of love and romance being fundamental to partnerships, and it's prohibited in modern Judaism. But, as commentators will point out, this system developed in a patriarchal society where women needed to rely on men to provide for them. 
a woman whose husband died and had no children could quickly become homeless or starve to death. Therefore, this system of marriage ensured not only the continuation of bloodlines, but the protection of widows. The Sadducees build on this system to construct a parable to test Jesus. Verses 20 to 22 explain that there were seven brothers, each of whom died in turn after being married to the same widow. Finally, the woman also died. So the Sadducees asked Jesus, whose wife will she be in the age to come? Jesus immediately sees the trap that they're setting. If he says there's no resurrection, he's actually siding with the Sadducees, the groups that's asking the question, which is a point for them. But if Jesus specifies which brother gets the wife, that invites a debate. It implies the other marriages are invalid. Maybe there's a problem with leveret marriage, which is the law of the land. So which direction is Jesus going to go? As usual, as we find when Jesus is confronted with these questions, he evades the framing of the question and comes up with an original solution. First, he calls the Sadducees flat out wrong for not knowing the scriptures or the power of God, both, I suspect, devastating insults. Next, Jesus says that in the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will instead be like angels in heaven. This is a bit mysterious, so we'll get back to it in a moment. Finally, Jesus defends the resurrection by referencing the account of the burning bush in Exodus. In Exodus 3, Moses meets God, who says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses' ancestors. Jesus quotes this and then says, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Our passage finishes by saying that the crowds were astonished at Jesus' teaching. Certainly, his words are surprising, and also, I'd say, a bit confusing. So what can we make of Jesus' cryptic response to the Sadducees? Let's look at the burning bush first. Earlier, the Sadducees, in verse 24, had invoked the authority of Moses. They they claim Moses told us as the source of this marriage custom. They align themselves with the author of Torah. Jesus replies, therefore, by also calling on Moses' authority. He claims Moses as supporting the resurrection, the very belief that the Sadducees deny. He does this by reminding that the crowd, that God is described as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not in the past tense. Jesus doesn't say that God was described as the God your ancestors worshipped. Rather, God is described as being the God of these people today. Or as Luke's gospel puts it, to God, all of these people are alive. This teaching on resurrection then sets up Jesus' comments on marriage, Resurrection, yes, Jesus says, but marriage and the resurrection, no. What does this mean? I think a key insight here is to recognize that people's ideas, including our ideas, about the afterlife or the age to come, always reflect in some way their views and concerns about everyday life today. For example, when this passage comes up in modern context, sometimes people wonder if there will be sex in heaven. The question arises because it's something that we modern folk are very interested in, and so some think that has to be an important part of the afterlife. But that's not really what this passage is about. For the ancients, the key questions around marriage were, who will be responsible for whom, and how will we guarantee children? In this ancient patriarchal society, leveret marriage helped provide an answer for when someone Uh, died without a child, but with a wife. And so the obvious question invited by this practice was, does this apply in the age to come? Can we look forward and see this as the perfection throughout, you know, human existence, even after the resurrection? According to Jesus, the answer is no. In fact, his tone suggests the entire framework is off base. The Sadducees talk about the widow being left to the brother and are asking which brother gets the wife after death. The wife is essentially property. 
In his answer, Jesus says, not only will people not marry, they will not be given in marriage. Women, of course, were always the ones being given. Jesus rejects that. He rejects the whole idea of wives belonging to men after death. And he also suggests that the concern about descendants is irrelevant, because in the age to come, people will be like angels, presumably not dying, I suppose, and so not worried about continuing their bloodline. Scholars like Joel Green agree that Jesus is challenging the status of women in his time and the system of women being given and taken. But if so, what does that mean for us today? Leveret marriage is not really a live issue in most of the West, and in most countries, women and men have more freedom about whether and who to marry than ever before. Mission accomplished, right? Maybe. Reading this passage, I was reminded that there are still many contexts, including in Western churches, where romance and children are idolized. You may not be forced into it, but it suggested that if you want to achieve the pinnacle of the good life, you need at least a steady partner, partner and ideally a kid or two, if you can get them. That's described as being true happiness, and perhaps even the remedy for our collective loneliness, emptiness, self-interest, social decline, falling birth rates, etc. The only problem is that if marriage is the ideal life, someone has to marry Mr. Collins. <laughs> or alternatively, someone has to marry Lydia Bennett. If you're a Lydia fan, I apologize. Indeed, promoting marriage as the ideal for everyone paradoxically makes actual marriages worse. Because it suggests you should cheer for any match, no matter how ill-suited. The alternative, I suggest, is that we can elevate singleness and celebrate it, and work on building strong communities that include those who are single, widowed, dating but living alone, living with roommates, and in every other situation possible. There's, I think, a good scriptural basis for this, and not only in today's text. A number of passages in the New Testament challenge 1st and 21st century family values. Three times in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus critiques giving priority to biological parents and siblings. In Acts and James, the care for wind widows is commended without any requirement for remarriage. Right? And in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul recommends that Christians remain unmarried as he is. These passages were in tension with the dominant paradigm of their day, and they had an enormous impact in the early church, inspiring the first Christians to care for widows and remain single. Put another way, the fact that there's no marriage in the resurrection means that God has no sons-in-law or daughters-in-law. Regardless of relationship status, everyone can be a full child of God, and no one needs to marry Mr. Collins. <laughs> Amen.